Good evening, everybody. We will get started at five o'clock. Okay, everybody, it is 5 p.m. Eastern time. Welcome to Creativity Tools, a virtual EDU summit featuring Google for Education by Apps, Events, and Acer. I'm Tom Mulaney. I'll be hosting, uh, although I'll be joined by Katie Fielding momentarily, and we are going to dive into creativity using technology in education. Uh, just a few things to go through before we get started with creativity. If you go to appsevents.com slash workspace, you can get a free 60-day trial of Google Workspace for Education Plus. So again, appsevents.com slash workspace for that free 60-day trial. And if you want to hashtag anything you learn on tonight's video, please use the hashtag Google PD and hashtag apps events. So tonight we have creativity tools. Katie Fielding will be presenting about Adobe uh, Creative Express and Canva. Uh, I'll be ta talking about Google Sites. I'll bring in Katie in just a moment. Couple more reminders. Uh, one, you can win free seats at any future apps events bootcamp or summit. All right. Um, email acer for uh, acer for education .emea at acer.com and use the hashtag acer for education or tweet at us at acer underscore education. Additionally, data literacy for schools and harnessing the power of data studio, a three week cohort online course is we're taking registrations, email james at appsevents.com to be included. Uh, data literacy is such a huge topic right now. And this is a really nice way to do it online and learn so much. And in three weeks later, you know uh, all you need to know. And from there, ISTE, uh, excuse me, Apps Events is the perfect partner for getting ISTE certified. We have upcoming cohorts in May, in July, August, September, October, November. So go to appsevents.com uh, and you can get uh, ISTE certified through Apps Events. All right. With that, I'm going to bring Katie Fielding into the stream. Good evening, Katie. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Katie, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, what's your uh, background? What brings you to this work? Yeah, I am a five-year tech coach. And before that, I was a science teacher. And I am a huge proponent and lover of universal design for learning. And I think creativity just really slides in there, supporting student voice and choice and giving students options of how they want to show their learning. So that's what gets me really excited about some of these creative tools. Awesome. Yes, uh, my background, I, I'm a consultant now. I work with schools from my computer screen, just like I'm doing right now. Uh, but before that, I was a coach. And before that, a history teacher. Before that, a special education teacher. And yes, it really is about kids putting their fingers in the dough and actually doing things rather than just at, you know at, answering questions or writing essays. There's so much more kids can do with this technology. 100%. All right, Katie, uh, you're up first. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys uh, in this first segment. And we want to call it, we're like doing a TV show, right? Tom, this is like a segment we're doing. We have three segments tonight. Yeah, three yes. Segments. Yeah. Um, no commercial breaks. So you're lucky. But um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you about Canva for Education. I know a lot of people love Canva and they love making things for their digital classroom spaces with Canva. 
But I'm going to show you and hopefully bring some ideas to you of how, how you can have your students using Canva in the classroom to show um, their learning. So I'm going to start by showing you some of my favorite Canva tips and tricks, and then kind of move into some instructional ideas of all the templates they have available and how you can use those in your class. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen um, if you want to pop it up. And give me one second. Sorry. There we go. And add the stream. There we go. Oh, no. We're... I shared the wrong screen. It's all good. <laughs> uh, no, Canva is a wonderful tool and it is a real world tool. So when students do things in your class, it's always great if there's some sort of connection to what people do in their daily lives. And Canva is that. And the first thing that I wanted to share is um, some information on using Canvas in your LMS. So I'm going to put this into the chat for Canva in your LMS. Put this link in the chat. This is on the Canva website. It will show you and tell you how you can get it integrated into Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Schoology, um, I think DTL. So whatever um, you know, LMS your district is using, Canva can be implemented into it. Additionally, um, if your district does not have Canva, it is like 100% free. There's really no reason that you should not get it set up for a single sign-on for all of your students. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. I can give you some points of contact at Canva that you can get in touch with, and they will help you get um, Canva for free for all your staff and all your students really something I think every school district should take advantage of. Um, the second thing that I want to um, point out and recommend is Design School. Um, Canva Design School is a um, really great resource if you or your students are just getting and starting to use Canva. This first course right here, Canva Design Skills for Students, was recently uh, just released and it just has videos and activities students can go through to learn some of the basic skills of using Canva. And then there's all different other types of courses here that you can benefit from. I like to do them when I have some free time or watch some videos. I always learn a little something new, a new tip or trick that I didn't know before. So those are just two good resources. If you're getting started with Canva in your district, how get it, get it in your LMS and then some ways to use it. Those are two great resources. Any uh, CTE teacher or, you know, career teacher would love, oh, you're just giving them free curriculum. So that's great. Yeah. Um, actually, yes. In my um, web design course or in a web design course in my school, I worked with those teachers and they totally latched on to using that, that curriculum. It tells a lot of, um, even some basic graphic design uh, principles. They have a whole course on that and I just love it. I love seeing all those people in the chat. We're so glad you're here today. Um, Marika, Tony, John, thanks for coming. All right, so let's get into Canva and the things that we love about it. So I know my teachers love to make buttons and banners and graphics for all of their Google Forms or Canvas pages. Um, wherever they want to add a graphic, they just love to make it in Canva. And I love that too. Um, but there's so much more that you could be doing with Canva. And what I really want to focus on is how we can have our students using it. So the first thing I want to kind of highlight are all the possible templates. And I just kind of sometimes go to the templates to get some ideas for what I may want to do in a class. So you can have Instagram stories, posts, Facebook posts. So all the social media stuff. You could use that in so many ways in different contents. So you could do a character analysis through making an Instagram story series uh, for a piece of literature or a time in history. You could have students make Instagram stories. Um, you could have students make oh, <laughs> a resume for historical figure. That could be a fun way to use these templates that are already here. Um, presentations, of course, are a go-to and websites. Your students can make portfolios of the work that they do throughout the year. They could make a business card, again, for a character, or they could make their own business card in um, another language, um, if we're our world language classes. Um, they could 
make a business, if you're maybe doing a marketing class, they could put a whole PR kit together with all of the things here, a whole marketing kit. Um, so those are things that you could go to. Um, infographics are like unlimited uses for all the contents. Having students create an infographic, a visual way of representing information is such a powerful um, template. And there's just tons of them here. And then, of course, the education section, tons of classroom kits. So that's like the aesthetic of how you want your digital classroom to look. And even lesson plans and worksheets and certificates. So you can, um, you know, I've downloaded some certificates before and pulled them into Google Slides as a background and then used Autocrat to, um, when students submit a Google form, they automatically get a certificate of completion. So there's lots of things that you can do and, and mix with other apps and, and pulling in these graphics to just really make a really professional look to your stuff. Tom, do you have any favorite templates? So I typically use uh, the YouTube thumbnails in just in my uh, everyday practice. And I noticed that that's, I think, 1280 by, or 1280 by 720. And that's just a really nice dimension size for anything. It kind of works nicely. Um, yeah. And I definitely think I love that idea. I think historical figure resumes and having kids work on that. Not only is that like a nice way to, to really get to know the, the, the figure, but also a little real world skill as well. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm gonna just for right now, just do a presentation and kind of get into the Canva editor and show you um, how to make some stuff. But I do wanna even show you a pro tip on searching the templates. So I'm gonna do a presentation, but maybe I already know that I want my whole color scheme to be green. I can type that in and now you'll see that, oh, I don't know why I just have one. Um, there should be way more than that. Template presentation green. Mm -mm. Okay, let's go back. Let me try again. Oh, no. Usually if I type in presentation green. All right, there's only one coming up and I don't know why. Usually there's like a million. <laughs> so this is perplexing. Um, but anyway, let's just go with it. We'll go with this template and we'll start here. For those of you who have never used the Canva editor, I'm going to give you a So when we get in here, uh, what topic are you feeling today, Tom? Uh, music. Music. All right. Perfect. I'm going to uh, let's see. just do a, add a slide. Here we go. Here's a slide. I want some music. So I'm going to go search up here for music. I find all of these great icons, photos, um, uh, graphics. You can see some of them are moving, so like I got this drum moving. And if I just exclusively want things that are moving, like I know I want kind of a GIF or sticker that has some movement to it, I can filter for that. And so when I click these little, this little filter right up here, I scroll and I check the box for animated. And now everything is either gonna be a video or it's gonna be one of these little moving uh, graphics. And so if you're wanting something that moves, it's easy to find something like that. But also in the same respect, if I want something that's not moving, so if I'm really keeping some students that may have a neurodivergent or have a, um, a seizure disorder in mind and I want it to be a static image, then I'll just search for those static images and keeping that more in mind. So when you go to the elements, definitely enter what you want to search for and then use that filter to kind of refine what you're getting. Another thing that I really love um, to use are the shapes. Um, you can use these in a whole myriad of ways. So those are fun. And then um, the stickers are always fun. Those usually have some motion photos and video. So like this video I can put in, I can easily right click on it and hide that set the video as the background to this slide. And then I can go ahead and go to some text. I can put this over it and I can say spring. So I can put text over the video. And then if I went into like a present mode, um, go. Right. 
you can see the text over the video. So this can be a really nice way and you can actually make videos in Canva uh, exclusively by either using their stock footage that they provide or by uploading your own images. And that's where I'll lead to uploads. So you can always upload your own media, photos, videos, audio, all of it you can upload here. You can see I was recently uploading some images from our school musical. Um, so you can upload photos and add them to your creations. So Katie, you can upload audio and video files into Canva and they just play in Canva when you present. Can you download those as video and audio files? What do you, or I guess not audio files, but can you download as video? Can you download what you create as a video? Yes. You 100% can, yes. So if I wanted to, um, if I was done with this and I wanted to share it and I wanted to download it, you'll see a whole range of things that I can download as. So in oh, this case, for some reason it's only showing, I don't know what's going on. This is very weird, but usually there's MP4, there's GIF, there's all these options. I'm gonna close out of this one and not making me very happy. Let's go to this one. Download. There we go. Those are usually all the options that I get when I want to save something. So I can save just images of each slide. I can save a PDF of all the slides together. I can make a video or a SVG for those of you who use a Cricut machine. The SVG is like such a hack to make your own images that you can then cut out with the Cricut. You just export it as the SVG and then you can cut it out with that vinyl cutter and make bulletin boards or, you know, slap it on a notebook to personalize it. So many options right there. Well, I was so proud of myself. I was talking to you before. I consider myself a Canva power user. I have hundreds of files. I've never once uploaded an audio or video file into the uploads ever. Uh, so I'm, I'm learning something tonight. Oh, Thank good. You, good. Yeah, of course. Um, let me just make a blank page here. So yeah, you can upload your own content here. So nice. And then you can also, you can see, you can pull your stuff in from Google Drive or Instagram too. Um, if you, if you want to, they, they have those things integrated. So if you have some pictures in Instagram, you can pull them in or Google Photos. They're all, you can see this one says new. They are always adding new things to Canva. Each week I'm like looking for the new little, uh, you know, Easter egg, Easter egg, new little features that they're adding in. Um, let's see. Okay. So photos, they have tons of stock images to use. And I want to show you one of my favorite features to do with the photos. So here's a photo. Always do edit image. There are such good little nuggets to take your photos to the next level there. So one of my favorite ones is doing the background remover. It's so nice. You can move this background so nicely. And then she's going to just be floating on that white background. Sometimes does take a minute. I think this is one of the best background removers that I've used. Yep, there we go. So there she is. And now if I wanted to change the background of this page, um, let's do blue. She's now nicely on that blue background. That's great. Let's look some more ways to edit the image. Um, there is this thing called Duotone, which is really fun. So now she can be in two colors. Um, and I can cancel that if I'm not happy with it. I can add shadows, and then there's all kinds of filters and other things that you can do to your photos. So don't miss out on the edit image button. There's lots of fun to be had there. Text, there's lots of text options. So they have some like kind of pre-created text themes you can use, but also you can just go up here and you can write handwriting and all these fonts will be handwriting. So there's a font you're looking for. They most likely have it or a dupe of it. Um, so if you can't find like the official uh, Nova Proxima, you'll probably find a dupe that will work pretty well. Including my favorite Fox font, Lexend. They have Lexend. Yes, they do. Um, this is another fun thing. This is brand or styles and brand kits. So any brand kits that you create are going to be here. But then they also just have all these palettes, suggested palettes. So if you make a presentation and then you're like, I'm not really feeling the colors, you can come down here and you can just click these buttons away. It will remix everything in your presentation to be in that color palette and you're good to go. Then the last thing I want to kind of draw your attention to, which is behind my little loom button, but there's a button right there that says more. You can't see it. 
And there's some really fun features in the more area. And the one that is the newest and probably most teachers of littles are excited about is this draw button. And so when I click draw, I got some pens um, I can draw on the page with. What my teachers are loving is the possibility of what you can do when you are here. Go to create design, you can import a file. So I have teachers importing their PDFs and then the student can basically fill out a worksheet with the, with the pens and markers. So you, this is a great way to pull those things you may already be using into Canva. Students can use the markers to respond or the text box, or they can even find images and videos to respond with. So providing students lots of options in their action and expression of how they want to share the answers to whatever you might be asking. Wow, that's fantastic, especially on a touch screen. Yes. So if you got a touch screen Chromebook, this is going to be super friendly for you. The other thing that's under more that I love are GIFs. Everyone loves a GIF. Um, I've done some really fun infographics in math class where in each step of the infographic is a different step of the math problem. And then they've picked a GIF that went with each step that they felt kind of symbolized or whatever step of the pro that problem made them think of or feel, they chose a gift that went along with it. So you can bring creativity and fun into math class um, as well with Canva. And then there's just lots of other integrations here. I love the Google Maps integration. So if you're doing a world language or a social studies project and they wanna put a map of you know, um, the Colosseum in their project, boom, there's now a map of the Colosseum in their project. And then let's make sure we got anything else. Um, those are some of the ones I love the most. You'll see there's Google Drive integration um, and then Pixabay Pixels, which are some more stock photos if you don't find what you need in just the regular Canva. But uh, I don't know uh, why you would need those. I just find everything in the Canva area. All right. So I see uh, Heba, she has a I got you on this one. Let's talk about sharing Canva creations. The first thing is you're always going to share up here with this share button. Now, if I want to get 50 people into this one Canva document, which I can totally do. So that seems to be what you want. You want more than one person to get into this. You're going to uh, say that anyone with the link can edit. And you're going to copy that link and you're going to put it in your LMS. That's probably the easiest way or, you know, uh, whatever you know collaborative document you and your students have pop that link in they click the link they get into this presentation and they can edit away if you want every student to have their own copy and that's what most teachers kind of want when we're doing some like annotation in that way unless it's collaborative of course but you're going to want to give a template link and so what we're going to do is we're going to click on more we're going to click template link and we're going to copy and that is the link we're going to give and so you'll see that it will look like this your students will see this page when it comes up and they will click the use template and they'll all get their own copy of um of this of this whatever canva creation it is that you want them to have so you have really two options get everyone into the same thing or give them each their own copy that was a great question um Let's see, what else do I want to show in the editor? I think that might be all for the editor. Those are the big things. Those are my favorite things. Um, I do want to show, um, let me open a new thing. We want, we're we doing music, right? So music, right? And this searches are safe, so they're not going to find anything inappropriate here. So I got these music um, graphics. Obviously, they are not laid out nicely. Maybe I want this, this, this. Maybe I want to line these things up. I'm going to hold my shift key down and grab these three items, and I want them aligned. And so that's when I'm going to use this position button. So this position button is going to be really useful for putting things in front of other things, so making layers on your graphic, and also for aligning things. So I'm going to do middle. And now you can see that they are all lined up. They're all, 
all have the same center of their item. And if I highlight them all at once, I can resize them all together. So that just allows me to, whatever I have on the page, line it up, resize things together, and your graphic is gonna look nice and organized uh, on the screen. Um, and also that layers can be really helpful. Let me show you an example of that. I'm gonna get a square, a square on my page. So right now that square covered up those music notes, but I don't want it to cover it up. I wanna be in the back, like a background. So I'm gonna move it backwards. And now those music notes move to the front and that's how layers on a graphic work. So if you want like highlight something by putting it in the box, that is going to be a really uh, great way to do it. And yeah, Canva is awesome, Jane. I love it too. All right, let's talk about presenting. So oftentimes we'll present um, one thing that my school does is we have TVs around the school with announcements and things, and we do all of our announcements through Canva. And the way we do it is we just have it in present mode, but we choose autoplay. So we have it so that each slide is going to be up for 10 seconds on the TV, and it just circles through. So if you're trying to get announcements through your school, like this is a great way. Maybe you were using another PowerPoint or Google Slides, but this, like, Again, the animations and the, the video and stuff, it just kind of takes your presentation to, to another level. So I think that is um, some of my favorite tips and tricks for Canva. Um, now let's kind of talk real quick, because we're almost, my time is almost up for this segment, about all the things that you can make. And I talked about some, but I kind of want to highlight some others. Um, some of my favorite, let's go here. Some of my favorite templates to look for are brainstorming templates. So I totally recommend the brainstorming templates. Oh, let's not on, but I don't know what. Brainstorm. I don't know why it's just searching my things. It's not searching the greater world of uh, Canva. Let me change teams and let me see if I'll have any better luck. Okay. Right, so maybe it's gonna be better. So brainstorming, I love, I have totally replaced my other whiteboarding tools with Canva. So I typed in brainstorm and here are all the types of brainstorming templates that I can get in. Again, I want my students to either get their own copy or jump into this one together. Sometimes also what I'll do is I will duplicate this slide uh, multiple times. And then what I will do is right here where it says page four, I will put names. So there's Katie's slide. There's Tom's slide. There's Jane's slide. And then when I give them a link, I'm going to say your name is on a slide. You're just going to jump to that slide and work on it. Then they can kind of see what everyone else is doing, kind of get some ideas. Uh, but they're not totally working alone, but they do have their own space to work. So I like using this little page name for, for putting those names in. So brainstorming templates, they have a lot of. Um, they also, I mentioned earlier, website. So they have tons of websites, great for portfolios or other types of projects. Students can make websites. And another one that I think is underused probably in school is menu. So I do these with um, world languages and they make the menu in the foreign language that they're teaching. And um, so again, they get to focus on the content, focus on the language and not have to focus so much on the, um, the creation and the design. And so I mentioned websites. Tom, I think you're gonna share some now about Google Sites. Well, I am, but I think I'm actually going to uh, bring up Canva and play with that Google Maps integration. You can just handle this part. That'd be okay, great. Perfect, um, perfect. But all right, let me get you off the screen or your presentation off the screen. And let me, here we go. So um, we all would love, love to hear your feedback. So if you have a moment, maybe wait till the end of the broadcast, because I'm about to go and Katie's got another segment. Uh, but you can always go to gsummit.link slash eval. Uh, and you can uh, give us feedback. That was, you know, Kate, you're looking for Katie Fielding and creating with Canva. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. That was awesome. And the, wow, the templates you shared, there's so many in there. Whew. There are so many. 
Oh my goodness. Wow. All right. Well, now that we have that, and I'll actually just throw that on the screen again there real quick. Um, well, let's talk about Google Sites. All right. It is a simple tool that students and teachers can use to create wonderful digital content. Now, I will say this. Creating a website is a real world skill. What's not a real world skill is creating bowling shoe ugly websites. So I, I want when teachers and students use Google Sites, I want us making wonderful looking, if not professional, then at least eye pleasing. Now, Katie, let me put you on the spot. What do you think is the most single most important thing you can do to make a beautiful website? I didn't. Ooh, picking a good, um, mm, so many things. I think picking a good color scheme can be like the base for it. Oh, one, I love that suggestion. We're going to talk about color a lot. I'm actually, though, talking, I think, this is in my humble opinion, uh, imagery. Professional imagery makes a website. Now, I know what I really agree. I know what you're thinking. I don't have a professional camera. I'm not good at that stuff. What do I do? My, you know, my phone pictures don't come out nicely. Well, what I'm going to tell you is that other people have uh, worried about this and done stuff for you. And the first one I'd go to is Unsplash. All right. When you search Unsplash, you can search it for any kind of images. We'll actually do a different, we'll, uh, we'll use my second site for a little demo in a second. But Unsplash is wonderful, professional stock photos. There's another great one called Pexels. And Pexels is... Um, all about it should have inclusive results, meaning that if you search for any one search term, you shouldn't just get white folks and heterosexual couples, right? You should get a diverse mix of results uh, so your students can see themselves in the things that you create and they create. I'll just type students real quick in Pexels and see what comes up. Of course, right when you demo, that's one. Okay. Uh, all right, a little diversity, maybe could be better, but oh yes, okay, they're pretty decent. Um, so that, and so by the way, if I wanna use something I see in Pexels, right? I see something I really like, I wanna use it. What's really nice is that I can click the share button and I can get this if I wanna cite this. Uh, in Unsplash, you get the same thing. And by the way, the actual, um, the actual uh, terms of, of use are that you don't even have to cite them. I've talked to students about this because, you know, the idea of, oh, you can't, you don't have to cite. What I tell them is we don't have to, and we are going to, because that's uh, the right thing to do. And, you know, in the, at the very footer of a Google site, you could just put that, you can copy this, bam, put that in your Google site footer, and you are good to go. All right. Um, I'd also suggest using Wikimedia, uh, being a history teacher, I make a lot of history themed, you know, different units, whatnot. I'll show you some of those in a little bit. Um, but there's plenty of great historical images, photographs, paintings, if you teach way back, um, that will make any websites you make pop and look lovely, and you don't have to do anything or worry about them. Now, having said that, we can get these wonderful images from Pexels on Splash Wikimedia Commons. And at the same time, thank you, Jane. Uh, at the same time, bandwidth is an issue. So if I'm in my classroom and I have 30 students all going to a bandwidth intensive website, what do you think is going to happen to the Wi-Fi? Or if I send students home and they are, you know, using a Wi-Fi connection that maybe isn't as good as the broadband that we have at school, well, it definitely won't be. It'll be home, not, you know, not business. Uh, so we want to make sure we don't have anything that's too bandwidth intensive. So what do we do? Well, there's a couple things we can do. Image optimizers. Go upload your image optimi uh, your images. And here I'll do JPEG uh, optimizer. If I ch click choose file, I think I can get, eh, let's try this picture here and upload. This is easygif.com. That's one of my favorites. Um, Oh, it's not. Oh, well, uh, you know what? Let me do it in Imagify. So another one is Imagify. Imagify 
is a little bit limited, like with the free account you get, I forget how much exactly, but it's nice. And you can see here that original is 3.9 megabytes. I, hey, Katie, in the future, nothing works. Ah, so this one only wants to do two mile, two megs and, and bigger. Um, Imagify should work with that. Let me try that one more time. Oh, because I have it in, it's a, I need to go to my PNG. This is a PNG. Here we go. All right, let me upload and see what happens now. Um, it's optimizing. Here we go. It's go. I click optimize. Um, what I will say, rule of thumb, one meg or less. That's just my rule of thumb. If I'm at one meg, now sometimes you can get, you know, you, you know, you're 1.2 megs. Try to optimize it if it doesn't work. And this looks like it's taking a hot minute to optimize it. Um, but 3.89 is probably too big. You don't want a 3.89 megabyte file, um, you know, image. And that's... Sorry, Tom, we're, yep. we're optimizing to make it more efficient for the website, right? Yes, we're decreasing the size. And here it is. Okay. Oh, the, I think I had to go a little more ultra. So sorry. Um, can, I can convert it to the different formats. I don't recommend doing that. Um, typically... Uh, here, I was able to at least cut this one down by 21% as far as the file size. Um, your mileage may vary, but definitely at least try it, especially if you know you have like really nice high quality images. Um, you don't want to put those originals on a website because then your bandwidth is going to get very, very. Yeah, and if we're thinking um, about students in especially like rural areas, that could be really important. Absolutely, 100%. Now, let's also be inclusive with our practices. Um, and so I'll give you just a little, small little thing you can do when you add an image to Google Sites. So if I'm in Google Sites, right, I'm going to click here. I'm going to click this and I'm going to the three dots. I'm going to click add alt text. This is just a simple thing you can do. Your students with screen readers. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that anyone can be part of your classroom. And so uh, I think students with screen readers are going to be parts of the typical classrooms uh, going forward, and that's wonderful. And if I have a website here and that student screen reader reaches this image, the screen reader is just going to skip it. It has no idea what this is. It might say image, but if I click this add alt text, and if it's just for decoration, I can just check that off and then don't worry about it. But if this is something essential for the understanding of the reader, then I'm going to say something like, a view of Philadelphia from the Schuylkill River. And I'll type that out and add that. That that exists, by the way, in a lot of the digital products you use in Google Docs and Slides. Um, anytime you're conveying any kind of information and meaning through images, consider using alt text. You know, I love the accessibility moment. Oh, of course, of course. Well, speaking of, uh, Katie earlier talked about color and color is so important. And one thing I do like to do is I love to grab colors from places uh, that, so for instance, if I have an image and I, uh, there's a color in there that I want to use as a theme on a website, I'm going to try to grab it. Now, my personal favorite tool for that is a Chrome extension. So let me go to a website real quick. This is tonight's this is our website for tonight's event. And I'm going to use Colorzilla. And if I go to Colorzilla and I just pick a color here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this blue color, all right? Now, what that did is that copied the six character hex code to my clipboard. What's the six character hex code? Every web color has an al six character alphanumeric hex code. We'll get a little bit more into them in a second, but this blue right now, I have the six character hex code on my clipboard. Let's say I really like that blue. I want to use it. Now, I, this happens with sites, but I notice a lot of times in slides presentations or even say like a Canva where you want to get creative. You want to get colorful. So I have a background color and then I have a different text color. But what if students can't see that? So let me show you an example of this. And you can put this in the chat or if you just want to look, you know, think to think to yourself about it. Which of these three, and Katie, if you want to share, feel free, which of these is the most pleasing? Which is the easiest to understand? Is it choice one? Is it choice two? Or is it choice three? For me, it's mm -hmm. choice three. Okay. 
Interesting you should say that because choice one, Katie, is a dark color, ba dark background with dark text. And in choice two is a light background with light text. And choice three then is a little different. That's a dark background, but the text is white, right? And that's what we call color contrast. And so you want to make it so that your colors have enough contrast so that most people will see them. Now, what, how can you, what can you do about this? Luckily, there's a website I really like. And again, it's not the only one, but it's one that is very, very uh, useful. It's called the Web Aim Color Contrast Checker. And it starts with a white background and this blue color. And it's telling me that the contrast ratio is 8.59 to 1. Don't worry about those numbers. You'll learn as you use this that anything that's 7 to 1 or better, you're going to be good to go. Um, but really, we care about the color of the text. So let's say I wanted to use that apps events blue against a white background. Let's see if that would work. So I'll click paste. And sure enough, it does. 7.92, it passes all five texts. Now, the great thing is, is that these are sliders. So I can make this fail. And, you, you know, I, I don't want to use that failing color, but I could. I can go all the way over here. I can click over to here. And I can play with colors and I can do all sorts of stuff. Um, there's all sorts of things I can do um, with as far as playing with colors. And if I have a color that's just a little bit bad, I can slide it till it's good. Now, white here is six Fs. Someone once explained to me why white is six Fs and not uh, six nines, because black is just six zeros. This is perfect color contrast. It's actually what I had in choice three. It's a 21 to one ratio. Um, so that's the exact perfect, and notice it passes by a lot. So if you ever are designing a website with color contrast in mind. Uh, Which you should always be, right? Well, you well okay. In mind, right? Let's say, let's say when you think about the design, color contrast is the most important factor. Mm. In that case, what I, I want you to go black and white because you will not fail. And if you ever need a little help thinking about this, uh, this may be too soon for some people, but just think of the Brooklyn Nets color scheme. I'm sorry to all my Nets fans out there. By the way, they with their city uniforms in their court, they went away from that black and white scheme and look what happened with the results. But anyway, the typical uh, Brooklyn Nets design aesthetic, the black and white is typically, I, I'll say this back in the day, the Cavs had some uniforms where they'd have like a per, like a maroon against a blue for the names and numbers. And I, I'm sitting there watching the game saying I'm having a hard time distinguishing those names and numbers on those jerseys. So black and white is probably going to be your best bet with that. OK, now in Google Sites, when we talk about color, as far as using color, I'll show you there's a couple places where you're going to use color. So let me just quickly uh, make some text here. And so we have te text there and you have the ability to change the text color, including a custom color with notice the old hex code, right? Um, additionally, oh, that was too much, sorry. Additionally, under themes, I'll talk more about themes in a minute, but you have that ability again, no matter what your theme, you can go in here and by hex code, change your hex color, uh, change that like the background colors and things like we'll get into themes later, but that theme color will affect, say, the background styles and things of that nature. So it does live there. Now, one thing I want to say really quickly about designing in Google Sites is always be, be mindful of cognitive load. Uh, I've seen websites where the website just scrolls on forever and ever and ever and ever. We don't want that. Few elements, keep it short and sweet. Remember, Google Sites has pages. You can always send your viewers off to another page, try to chunk that information. Maybe this is a special education teacher in me, but you don't, if you notice that you have to scroll for a long time on your page, that page should probably be broken up into two pages, if that makes sense. So just be careful about that. Now, let's talk about a few things here. One thing I notice with Google Sites, if I'm making a Google Site for my students, I want it to be immersive. I want it to feel like the topic we're talking about. And one of the very, very most important ways to do that is this button right here. What? 
Now, if you notice, we have our Chrome tabs. And I'll give you an example. This Chrome tab is clearly a Google Slides. This is Google Forms. This one's Unsplash, that's Pexels, Wikimedia right here. Um, here's Google Drawings. Uh, now, when your students see your site in this tab, I want them to see some sort of image, some sort of something. Now, the good news is you could either use Canva, as long as you use a transparent background, I highly recommend transparent backgrounds for this purpose, um, or you can just go into Google Drawings and you can make with, with a, so I'll just call this favicon, and you can set your page dimensions. Uh, let's see, page setup, change it to custom. And the standard is 512 by 512 pixels. So that way, and now you just design whatever you want and you down, file, download as a PNG. Where is that? Download as a PNG. Now, why do I say that? Because if you don't do that, it's going to have that Google Sites favicon. That to me, that's not immersive. I, I'm not immersed in your site if I see a Google Sites favicon uh, at the very top of it. And you can edit that by clicking these three dots. Or is it, it's under settings. Here we go, it's under settings. Uh, brand images. And you have a logo, you can do a logo which will live in the upper left corner of the site. That to me, that's choice. You could do that. It could be the same as your favicon. It could be a little tweak different. That's your choice. But here you can either upload or select your favicon from Google Drive. Bam, you have a nice little branding for uh, your site. Hey, Tom, I have a question. Yeah. So like the favicon is so small. Like, do you have a recommended number of colors that should be in one or should I put words in it? Okay, because it's so small, it should be very, very simple. Okay, um, you can get like, like I'll give you an example. This apps events one, that's one's pretty nice. It's got four colors. Uh, the only thing I'll definitely say about that is that uh, you don't want to use say drop shadows. That kind of went away when the if you remember at one point your iPhone had shadowy like buttons that simulated. Uh, actual buttons. And then one yeah. day in the early 2010s, that went away. That's so right now, drop shadows and whatnot are just kind of out, out of vogue. Um, but it's simple. Simplicity is definitely text will not work. Text is not you're not going to write out your logo in text. It will not work. That makes sense. Our, yeah. Now, speaking of that, I want to talk about design. Uh, as far as the front of your page. Now, I notice this a lot in uh, news articles, but this applies to websites too. I'll give you an example here. This is from Eater, New York. Notice the very top of this article is a big banner image. Right now, big banner images are kind of in. Again, they often are, are in news articles, I notice, but if you want to take advantage of that, so here under header type, you can go with large banner or cover. You know, and again, I would go with an actual image, but don't be, you know, change the image. And then there you can select your image, um, if, whether it be Google Drive or you upload something. Um, but feel free. You can go with a nice big banner. That is something that is in at the moment. Now, having said that. So here, you know, what, I'll, I'll actually just really quickly. Let me change the image here. Uh, let me select an image. Now, you know what? Let me go real quick with just one of their standard ones. I don't recommend it but let's pretend we did that. Let's say it was a, a website for brainstorming or something like that. Then it might actually be totally appropriate. Now, having said that, notice right here, there's a readability adjustment. So any text you throw here will pop against that. that now you can remove it. I don't recommend that because notice already that text is getting a little lost. Now I can always preview that. But yeah, you see that text is kind of lost there if I don't highlight it. Yeah. But if I go back and it just do the readability adjustment that is automatic, it pops more and it, it, there's a little bit of a blurring or like an overlay over it uh, to, so that that text is there. Uh, while we're on Google.
Did we lose Tom? Hmm. Oh, it looks like we lost Tom. Um, unfortunately. He's driving the ship, so I can't stop it. Hi, all. It looks like we, we lost Tom for a moment, so hopefully he'll jump back in. Um, he was uh, driving the ship, so I can't share my screen or anything unless he's doing it. Um, so hopefully he'll get back in here. But um, he was sharing some really great stuff about Google Sites. Um, I would love it if you in the chat would share anything you've done with Google Sites or any questions you have about Google Sites that he can answer when he gets back in. Let's see if I can share my screen. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Yep, I cannot without him here. <laughs> so this is a bit of a pickle. Oh, the the internet um, is always fun like that. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So he was definitely sharing some design principles and showing about Google Sites. But if there's any questions you have, please put them in the chat. Oh, digital portfolios, Tony. Yes, I love that. I love that. I was in a class, a game design class today, showing those students how to make portfolios. And now they're going to spend this last part of the year filling it with all of their creations, uh, game creations that they made throughout the year. So portfolios are such a good use for it. Um, I will pop into the chat a, a simple, a very simple Google site um, that I made recently and that actually has some resources that you may be able to use. And so this Google site is called My Dig Life. And this is a site I made to house some one sheeters um, that are talking, and I made them for seniors that are about to graduate. They're about to go off into their own digital life. And so there's an email, a one-sheeter, cloud storage, uh, notes, uh, what else? Calendars and to-do lists. So I did a series of workshops for our seniors. Each week, we went over a different uh, topic, and these is kind of the notes I provided them. So please feel free to use this with your students. Um, I think it's really important that we prepare students not just to be good digital citizens, but also to be um, really good um, at digital literacy so we can know what is um, going to be um, you know, safe tools to use, what's going to be not. You know, we've kept them in school. We've kept them in this little walled garden, but um, they're about to be out in the big, big bad world. And in a way, I'm so jealous of them and their ability to get started in their uh, digital life and start their whole system. So I just wanted to give them some guidance. So that Google site hopefully is something you will be able to use. Let me check in and see if Tom, it looks like Tony said that there have been bad storms in the area. And they lost power at school, which is nearby. Okay. So that might be a little bit of a pickle because um, I'm not going to be able to to share anything if he doesn't get back. We might just need to end the show, unfortunately. Let me see if I can message him. I'm just going to go off camera for a minute. All right. Hopefully he'll be back in just a moment. He just sent me a message and said that he was trying to get back online, um, that he lost the internet. Um, but yeah, Google Sites can be used for so many things. Um, yeah, I will share the link that I just said. I thought I shared it in the chat. Maybe not. 
Oh, it is um, mydigilife.com. Um, so I'll put it in again. Um, there you go. And that is just some resources. And there are Canva templates for each of those pages that you can then remix and make your own. So if you see something in there that you're like, oh, I would actually add this, um, please do that. Please, please do that. Once he gets back, hopefully he'll be back soon. Tom, are you there? Nope. Still not here. This is what the internet is, right? Oh, goodness. Um, what else can I talk about without a visual, right? It's so hard. Um, I'm going to be talking in just a few minutes about Adobe Creative Cloud Express, which you probably knew as Adobe Spark. They changed their name just a few months ago. If you love Adobe Spark or Adobe Creative Cloud Express in the chat, let me know. Let me know what you've done with those. I love it because Canva is like all the things. And sometimes for some of our students, it can be overwhelming. Canva has too many options. I like Adobe Spark because it's a little more reined in. Students are either going to be making a post, which is a graphic, or a page, which is a small web page, or a video. So kind of a limited set of three things. Well, there's still templates for all the graphics, but there's kind of just three buckets that things fall in rather than Canva, which is everything and can be great for some students. But some, I find that our L students really thrive in Adobe Creative Cloud Express. So if he gets back here, I'm going to show you how to make pages, posts, and videos. I'm also going to show you how to make a brand kit and some of my favorite design tools. But if he doesn't get back, I guess that's not going to happen. Um, let's see. I guess next time they should make two of us hosts. Um, but Or maybe the person without storms. Um, let's see. I really love all of these creation tools because I love universal design for learning. And if you love universal design for learning, let me know in the chat. Um, and if you don't know what it is, please like go instantly to cast.org and learn about universal design for learning. Let me find a... Hey, Katie, I'm so sorry. You're back. I'm back. Yes. Whoop, 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 whoop. I was trying oh, to my on the show without being able to share my screen. I don't think it was. Uh, I am so sorry, my, Katie. Oh, um, so good. So, oh my goodness. Uh, we're, we're running a little short on time with, with my Google sites. I'm so sorry. I'm just going to show you a couple Take things. Take a few more and, minutes, Tom. It's okay. All right. Let me bring up my screen and then we'll go from there. Um, I have a few things kind of uh, picked out that I wanted to demo real quick, and then we're going to go on. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. Hold on. Uh, share screen. All right, here we go. All right, so thank you all for hanging with. Sorry about that. Uh, I want to show you a few things. One, uh, now in Google Sites, this is a relatively new um update, but you can basically use all the fonts that you have in Google Docs or slides. Okay. So um, this one is one, uh, what is a special elite? I like this one. This is a, a digital escape room about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so like this kind of inky typewriter, I really like that. Um, and uh, what should we call it? Uh, yeah. So that's a really nice one. Uh, so take advantage of that. I, I often use Lexend. Um, by the way, the effect on this Banner image is cover image. We'll talk about that at the very end. Um, the other thing I'd say is a couple of things. One, collapsible text. So if you know, remember we talked about cognitive load. One way to break that up a little bit is if you have some text, just make it collapsible, put a little title at the top. And that actually, what that's a little bit like that drop down in Google Forms where it can kind of like hide the, you know, 100 different or 50 different states or 180 countries, right? So, um, Collapsible text, really nice. The other thing, buttons. So in your Google Sites, you can add buttons. If I click insert button, and one thing I'm going to say about buttons, when you work with kids, buttons should pop. So it is the one chance to tell kids, guess what, kids? You can drop 
uh, you can go all caps, have at it, all caps, buttons should be in all caps. Uh, from there, uh, I would say take advantage of image carousels. They work best for landscape images, but image carousels are very nice. You know, you get that little dot at the very bottom and you have the, you know, back and forth. Definitely take advantage of those. Um, all right. With that, uh, I did want to show Did we lose you again, Tom? Mm -hmm. We did. I think we might have lost him again. Um, not quite fortunate. Um, okay. I'm going to, in the chat, I'm going to put a link to some Adobe Spark resources that I have, Adobe Creative Cloud resources. I really love Adobe Creative Cloud, as I was saying earlier, because I think it really does support universal design for learning. It really allows students to do those um, action and expression choices without having it be an overwhelming platform that like Canva can sometimes be. Um, if you get into Adobe Creative Cloud Express, which is also, like Canva, a 100% free tool for all schools, okay? If you get in there, students can make a post, a page, and a video. Three great things. There are also now quick actions. So some of those things Tom was showing you earlier at some other websites, like resizing images or turning things into a GIF, you can now do that 100% in Adobe Creative Cloud Express. So you're going to look for the quick actions area. You can remove remove background, you can convert a file to a JPEG, you can convert a file to a PNG, you can merge videos together. You can do all kinds of things with these new quick actions in Adobe Creative Cloud Express. One of my favorite things to have students do when I first work with them is to build a brand. So you'll find in Adobe Creative Cloud Express this area called brands. Um, and they can build a brand kit. So the brand kit is a collection of colors, a collection of fonts, and a collection of logos. And that's the first thing I do when I go into a, a classroom with students is we work on the brand. We want them to think about the, the visual story that they want to tell with their colors, their fonts, and their um, imagery. And because that really sets the tone for whatever information they're trying to convey. So one thing that I like to do with um, students is first build that color palette and one of my favorite tools for building a color palette, which I would love to show you but can't, and I will put in the chat, is called coolers.co. At this website, you can simply press your space bar over and over and lock in colors and make a color palette of five colors. You'll see the hex codes at the bottom of the page. Students will then be able to click those codes and um, copy them and put them in their brand kit in Adobe Creative Cloud Express. So that is where I have students start, is building their brand, thinking about their font, thinking about their visual story that they're going to tell with their video, their post, or their page. The next thing I like to do after they have built the brand kit is we get into making the post, the page, or the video. So when we're thinking about Adobe Spark videos, it's very much like a slideshow that has music in the background and some imagery. You can have short 30 second clips of video that you can upload, but otherwise it's really just kind of images, slides, and text. Um, and you pick a song that plays throughout the whole video. I've done some really fun poetry projects with Adobe Spark or Adobe Creative Cloud video, um, as well as some uh, public service announcement projects. Any of those video projects that you're kind of concerned about having students do because the the Editing can kind of be laborious for video projects. That is a great option. The Adobe Spark pages are a single web page, one little web page. And they are a great option for a project. You can link pages to other pages, but it is a single web page. So students would need to make a series of several Adobe Creative Cloud pages and then link them by creating buttons on the page. And the third thing is posts. And these are, there are templates just like in the other tool that I talked about. 
There are templates for resumes. There are templates for worksheets. There are templates for menus. There are templates for all the things in an Adobe Spark post. So if you're wanting students to make graphics, that is where they're going to go in Adobe Creative Cloud Express. All of these things also do have LMS integration, kind of like I talked with Canva. And again, Adobe Creative Cloud Express is free. So please um, reach out um, if you need help getting it set up. I can point you in the direction of those resources. Actually, yeah, I can point you in the direction of those resources. Feel free to reach out to me. But just like um, any other tool, you can get single sign-on. So students in my district easily log in with their school email address. And if they're already in Microsoft in another tab, they get pulled right into Adobe Creative Cloud Express very easily. We also use Canvas in my district. And the integration for Adobe Creative Cloud Express is great. It's a way that I can give each kid their own copy of a template. So I can make an Adobe Spark page or post or video. Or I can start it as a scaffold for students. And then I can use that Canvas assignment to give each kid their own copy of that template. And then they go to work and they are able to then turn it into Canvas. So Canvas integration or other LMS integration, perfect. And now all of these quick actions are like my favorite thing. They also have a collaboration with Wakelet. So if you're a Wakelet lover, there is a way to create a Wakelet post in here. And also if you are in Wakelet itself, you'll see Adobe uh, Creative Cloud Express as an option. So just so many things that you can do with these Adobe tools. They're kind of definitely a gateway to the professional level Adobe Creative Cloud that some of our students will start to use in secondary school, um, you know, in our upper secondary courses for editing photos or making graphics with Illustrator. So Photoshop, um, Illustrator, this is kind of the baby, the baby pre-version. So kind of getting them thinking about designers without all the complications of those tools. And um, yeah, Tom, you're back. Yeah, I'm sorry, Katie. I think maybe at this point we should probably just have you share your screen for a little, we'll wrap up and we'll go from, you know, we'll have you do uh, Adobe and we'll go from there. <laughs> I'm so perfect, sorry. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, I guess my screen's ready to go. And if you want to put it up there, perfect. This way, if you fall out, I'll be here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, so I already talked a lot about Adobe Spark. Um, but just no visuals. So let's kind of do the visual piece. So here's Adobe Creative Cloud Express. Oh, oh hold on, hold on. Oh, hold on. Uh, remove, add a stream. Sorry. Yep. So here's Adobe Creative Cloud Express. Um, if I click the plus sign, that's where I always tell students to start from. This is where they can get to those pages, posts, or video. You'll see video, video. These are all the Adobe Spark page. And this is the post. Then all those quick actions I talked about. So some of those things that Tom showed you other tools for, you can do that right here in Adobe Creative Cloud Express, resizing images, converting images, converting PDFs, converting trimming videos. You can do that all now right in here. I want to show you that um, the brands piece that I talked about earlier. So I talked about having students pick their color palette and fonts. You're going to do that in the brands area. And so if I click create a brand, I'm going to pull in those colors. So the first thing is a logo, but that's the step you can skip. And I often have students do. So now we're colors. And um, so I had shared earlier when I was talking about coolers, and now you can see it. It's one of my favorite little design tools. Every time I, I press the space bar, the color palette will change. And if I want to lock in a color, like say I like this color, can lock that in and keep changing the other colors until I get a whole palette of five colors that I want as my brand. I can then copy these hex codes and bring it over to Adobe Creative Cloud Express, pop that hex code in without the extra hex and save it. And now that is going to be the main color of my brand. Then I can choose my font. There are some fonts here already available. I can also go to some websites where you can download fonts like dafont.com and I can pull those font um, um, files in myself. So I could click this and say, add my own fonts. It's gonna ask me to look for that file font, that font file on my computer and pull it in. 
And that's what it takes to create a brand. The brand is really useful for making the Adobe Spark pages and posts. Let me show you. Uh, creating the brand takes just a second. All right, so here I am in my brand. Now I can add additional colors. So I can go back and get these colors from my hex codes, save. And then another color. I'm just gonna stick to three right now. So I have three colors in my brand saved. Perfect. I can add additional fonts if I want. And then this is where I get to edit what the pages and the posts are gonna look like. So you will see here that um, I have a light, a medium, and a dark page and a light, a medium, dark video. So if students really wanna customize what they make in Adobe Creative Cloud Express, they do it here in the brand page. They wanna customize how it looks. Then they go start to make the video or the page. So let me show you what that means. So this is my light template for my brand. And I can have the font here. I can change how I want my pages to look here. I have my colors. I can change the colors for my brand kit. And maybe I want, let's see, Lato Bold. I can change the fonts. So the brand kit area is really where the student will do all the customization for their project. On this homepage, this is where they'll see, you know, some templates that are being highlighted and then quick action. And then along the bottom is gonna be anything that you've created um, and um, that you've created most recently. You can also then click view all and you can view all the things that you have created. Every month, Adobe Creative Cloud Express releases a teacher and a student challenge. So let me show you, uh, let me show you a challenge. So like this was a challenge for February, I think. And um, so they gave you a template to start from and I created this poster and actually my poster, they actually printed it for me and sent it to me because I kind of won, I was one of the winners of the challenge. So definitely look on the Adobe Creative Cloud Express or Adobe for Education Twitter every month. We're about the end of April. So there's still a few days left to do the April challenge. And the May challenge will be just around the corner. Um, I've got a couple more things to show you. Uh, projects. You can also create folders of your work here. This can be a nice way to keep your things organized. You can also see things that are shared with you and anything that you've used recently. So projects is where to go. Libraries is a way that you can share things with students. So if you can create, you can create templates uh, in a library, and then you can share those templates with students who can then copy them and um, use that template to start from. So let me show you an example. So I want to create a library. I'll call it Apps Events. So, so. You'll see I can add a template so I can look at all of my projects that I've done. Um, I'm going to just select this one. And now I'm going to call this um, February template. And now this template is going to be here in this library. If I want to share this library with my students, I can make a public link. And I can share that library and students can go in and make a copy of that of their own and have it as a place to start from. One more thing that I want to share that's not exactly an Adobe Creative Cloud Express, but is an Adobe tool is color.adobe.com. Earlier, Tom talked about some accessibility checking with color contrast checker. And this is, um, they also have one, but they also have a colorblind safe checker. And that's what I'm going to highlight here. So if you have students in your classroom that are colorblind, um, and I wanted to show you just like, okay, so we're going to make a like, interesting color palette. All right, so I have not, I'm not colorblind, so I see these as five different colors. But if I am colorblind, and you'll see these shows you the three most common types of colorblindness, this color, this color, and this color, for these two types, look kind of just the same same shade of different of uh, 
different shades of the same color. They all kind of like a golden color. And we, so we have two blues and two golds. So if I have this type of color blindness, I'm just going to see blue and gold instead of this wide array of colors. So if you're designing something, especially that's part of like maybe your school's PR, something that's really going to be in the public on your school's Twitter or something, it's really nice to run those colors through a color blind checker because color blindness is actually quite frequent. And so you really do definitely have members of your school population that um, that have color blindness and may, especially if you, if I was to put these um, pink letters on a blue background, they wouldn't be able to see it. It would just be blue. So your message is not going to get across. And our goal with any type of PR is to try and get our message across to as many people as possible, right? And so if we're cutting out a certain percentage, those people that are colorblind, that's not great. All right. The last thing that I want to share with you is one of my favorite little hack tools um, is Undraw. And Undraw is a great place to go to get some imagery for your Google Sites. Um, this is um, open source, and uh, you can use this uh, without attribution if you want. But what you can do is click Browse Now, and you'll see all these little graphics that are just great, they're, they're cute. But if we go back to that hex code and matching, you know, whatever our website is, I can go up here and I can pick whatever shade or pick color that I've chosen for my Google Sites website theme, and I can pull that in right there. So then I can just click on these images and download either as an SVG or a PNG and, and put those quickly in my PowerPoint or a website for a cohesive look. I really like to try and stick to one artist when I'm using graphics for either a presentation or a website. So it all looks very professional. It looks cohesive amongst all the pages. Um, and that's just one of my design tips is cohesion is really important. Um, all right, back to you, Tom. Awesome. Well, thank you, Katie. And I'm hoping that I will, um, I hope I will stick around for the rest of our time. Fingers crossed, who knows? Uh, but real quick, I'm just going to share one real quick tool. And if you notice in my um, Cuban Missile Crisis digital escape room, I have this. Um, it's technically an animated GIF, but it's I took an image. And if I, if I go to um, the preview, it gets cut off here. But in the preview, it should. Yeah, it should look. There we go. Um, you see you see this and there's that little those lines going through like it's an old film. And then, you know, you scroll down and you get your um, special elite text and whatnot. I did that with a website called Lunapic. Lunapic.com. It looks like it's a website from 1997. Uh, but when I upload an image, let's upload an image into it. And when I do that, uh, I can add all kinds of effects and animations. It's really, really nice. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of tools you can use to edit. But just really quickly, if I go to art, and let's say I go to here, I'll go to um, floating. And it gives it like this effect that I can then, um, yeah, you see there, boom, I have this one effect and I can actually reduce the amount of the effect. And I can also add um, some animation. And I'm trying to remember which one the Cuban Missile Crisis was. Uh, let's, I'll do pouring rain here. Um, Oh, there it is. I don't know if you all can tell, but it actually is kind of raining there uh, on the image, uh, which is kind of cool. And actually for the for what the image is, that's kind of like appropriate. Um, so it's just this thing where you can take images you have and just bring them to life uh, in a way that maybe you wouldn't earlier. Oh, and by the way, so Katie, uh, if we have a, my digital life, awesome. Uh, awesome. I think you know the two things that I would point out uh, if I'm yeah. going to do... I'm going to do fashion police, um, but uh, based on what we talked about, uh, I, I want to, I would love to see a favicon here. Um, oh, and by the way, because you're using that typewriter font, you might be able to match the typewriter font here. That I feel like is more kind of your choice, you know, like that's, you know, that's like your call, but, um, right. and, and then of course the, um, I want to see all caps for all these buttons. Give me those all caps. And then, uh, I think uh, that would be my makeover tips for that, my home renovation for your website. There. I mean, I love a makeover, so I'll take that. I uh, love feedback. It's like iron sharpens iron, right? We get better with feedback. 
and by, and by the way, I love that uh, you were very excited about my black and white suggestion. You thought that was a great I idea. Yes. Uh, yes, I want. Uh, yes, um, but that's really cool. And it's just such a cool thing that you're you're basically using this website to kind of teach your high school students about um, their digital lives going forward, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I, well, this was more of a repository to share it with other teachers so they could oh, okay. use it. But these one sheeters that I share um, are, yeah, are resourced to teach outgoing seniors about um, their digital lives. They have this like exciting opportunity. I think it's exciting to kind of start their digital lives, their adult digital lives and thinking about, you know, email, which they'll use for banking and all those types of things and how to like what, you know, they've been given addresses, you know, their whole school life. And yeah, they probably have a personal address, but maybe they need a personal professional address. And they need to think about like how to distinguish, you know, what to email and, you know, where to email and how to organize and all those things that, you know, don't necessarily get taught. Um, yeah. And, and if you, feel, please feel free to share any favorite creative tools in the chat uh, for sure. And by the way, I think I know what this was made. Am I wrong to guess that this was that this one sheeter was made in Canva? It is. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see a link to a template where if you want to take that and make it your own, um, you will be able to. Oh, there it is. Canva template. I, by the way, I, I, that whole sharing using the template, that was fantastic. Oh, that is so cool. Because oh, the that templates are a game changer for sure. And that is a feature that you get in the education uh, type of account, but would be something you would have to pay for in a premium account. So it's just, you can't do the template in the regular old free account. Awesome. And I'm seeing some sort of typewriter font and a Lexend font uh, in here. So love. Well, you know, yes, I am an elder millennial. So I was trying to hack the um, my so-called life logo with the my digital life logo. Okay. <laughs> and, um, so that's what I was kind of basing it and remixing it on. And so, yeah, I just kind of used um, I like to stick to two fonts whenever I make something. So I like to have like a a font where it's readable, like Lexend, and then kind of a decorative font. But I still try and stick to decorative fonts that are very legible. I don't like curly fonts because those just aren't as accessible. It's a wonderful design tip. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Uh, all right. With that, let's kind of... So if you want to give feedback to either me on my Google uh, Sites session or Katie on uh, Sparking Up Your Life with Adobe Express, um, please use the uh, use the eval link gsummit.com or excuse me, sorry, gsummit.link slash eval. And uh, while we have you, definitely take a look at the Acer Chromebook range. Uh, it ranges from 11 to 15 inches, uh, which has it has those traditional or that 360 form factor. Uh, rear and world facing cameras. So, so cool for students to document what yeah. they do at school. And everything we talked about today can be done on a Chromebook. So that's good. Abs yes. Yeah. All web-based. Exactly right. Yes. Um, and uh, it comes with a stylus too. And it is super rug ruggedized, uh, which in schools is a very, very important thing. Uh, all right. Now, for apps events, you can always go to video.appsevents.com. You can go uh, to YouTube, to uh, our YouTube channel, to watch this and other uh, educational videos. You can also take a look at the International Schools Podcast. Check that out on Podbean or at the International Schools Podcast.com. And uh, we want to thank you, our premier summer summit sponsor, Acer. Uh, and again, go to gsummit.link slash Acer to win free seats to any future apps event boot uh, Boots, uh, boot camp or summit. Easy for me to say. And thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for bearing with our technical difficulties. Um, I'm, we're happy to entertain any questions in the next minute or so. Uh, sorry for my technical difficulties. Oh boy, the internet. Um, you know, Katie, you had a little bit uh, during Canva, although when it came time for the re resumes, I think there were only about a million templates, but for your green, oh, yeah. you know, um, and, but, or, and I was tempted to say, even in the future, nothing works. And then sure enough, it just, for, when it came time for me to present, 
uh, all went out. But thank you for rolling with that, Katie. Much appreciated. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, but yeah, um, any any final words before we sign off, Katie? I mean, I would just really ask and hope that you get kids creating in some way or another with either one of these tools that we shared or another tool. I mean, we all have our favorites. I also love book creator. I also love bringing podcasting into the classroom. So any way that you can give students choice and voice and different opportunities for expressing what they've learned, that's the goal. Absolutely. Uh, could not agree more. So thank you all. I will, I'll cut the broadcast here, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, and best of luck to you uh, in your creative endeavors. Bye. Have a good night.